Okay, so we have mito and chondria. Uh, so we have uh, mito breaks down to thread, and chondria is granule. So the mitochondria vary in size from 0.5 micrometers to 1 micrometer. They're ellipsoidal in shape, and there can be up to 2,000 mitochondria per cell, which makes up about 20% of the cell volume overall. So the mitochondria evolve from gram-negative bacteria, and um, they're called gram-negative bacteria because there's a certain stain that um, gram-negative bacteria can be seen through, and then they have gram-positive bacteria, which is another stain that gram-positive uh, bacteria can be analyzed under. And that has to do with the um, coat of the bacteria. <clears throat> so anyways, the mitochondria evolve from gram-negative bacillus, which is a rod bacteria, and I assume that because it's rooted in the word thread, and thread are rods, and the other gram-negative bacteria, or gram-positive, are cocci. So cocci are spherical, bacillus, the suffix, means um, rod-like, which is it kind of important later. Um, so anyways, uh, they evolve from gram-negative bacteria, and at one point, our eukaryotic cells uh, were in an anaerobic environment, and then there was a dramatic change on the earth, and it became more oxygenated, and that's when um, the eukaryotic uh, cells absorbed these gram-negative bacteria to form what is now called the mitochondria. So it's a symbiotic relationship, and it's the mitochondria that are the aerobic aspect of our cells. <clears throat> So, this symbiotic relationship is where the mitochondria produce ATP, water, and carbon dioxide as a byproduct from cell respiration, and they um, use glucose and oxygen to do that. So these are some of the uh, substrates, starting materials, that we have to provide for the mitochondria to give us ATP as an energy source. So that's uh, symbiotic in that regard. And we also have to provide the mitochondria with other nutrients, like the ones I mentioned in the previous video, with, with the niacin and all the B vitamins, and all these sulfurs over here in, in these irons, which I'll get to in a little bit. So, um, one thing that mitochondria don't have that I've noticed is a plasmid. Most bacteria have a plasmid, and that's a circular... Um, part of DNA that's separate from the rest of the bacterial DNA <clears throat> and they can those plasmids can be used for antibiotic resistance bacteriophage re resistance and, and what a phage is is a, is a virus that attacks a bacteria so it's that's a phage uh, P-H-A-G-E and I just put the R here for resistance and that's some of some of the ways that a plasmid can help a bacteria survive and like I said, the mitochondria do not have that. <clears throat> so let's get over to the anatomy of a mitochondria. Oh, a couple more things is that when they vary in size from 0.5 micrometers to 1 micrometer, so you're going to find uh, bacteria that are 1 micrometer, more in the um, areas of the body that require more energy, like the heart and the skeletal muscle. Um, and they'll be smaller in the liver because we don't need... Um, uh, as much energy in the liver as we do in the heart in the, in the skeletal, uh, skeletal muscle. <clears throat> Alright, so let's get on with the anatomy of the mitochondria. So here in blue we have the outer membrane. And that's about 50% protein and once again a membrane is just a, a fatty layer that encaps encapsulates the cell. Uh, and that's 52% protein, and that's what you're going to find here, and I highlighted that um, with the mouse liver cell at 46% protein, um, their membrane, pardon me, and the plasma membrane is about 49% uh, protein. So this outer membrane is more likely one of the eukaryotic um, membranes rather than a bacteria ancestry, uh, a, bact uh, a membrane from the bacteria part of the mitochondria. And, and this outer membrane here has uh, porins, which are basically like passageways that allow substances to go and come as they please. 
uh, up to 10 kilodaltons. So uh, a, a substance as, as large as 10 kilodaltons can go in and out of this outer membrane pretty much at, at free will. And um, so proteins, small proteins can be as small as 10 kilodaltons. So you're going to get a lot of traffic, uh, anything under 10 kilodaltons, uh, antibiotics, um, probably some viruses in small proteins and solutes all are going to have pre, free passage through these porins. And one of the things that a porin could be is that since there's up to 2,000 mitochondria per cell, these mitochondria may line up next to each other with their porins and then pass material back and forth between one another as well as to the rest of this uh, cell in our body. So then we have the inner membrane, which is here in red, and that's 75% protein. Now that's 50% more protein in that membrane than the outer membrane. And that's indicative of what you'll find in bacterial cell walls. Because they only have one cell wall. Uh, their cell wall has all the machinery that they need to perform all their, all their me metabolic processes where eukaryotic cells have their machinery isolated in these small compartments called organelles. So you're going to have, so this inner membrane is 75% protein, which echoes back to the fact that they are originally a gram negative bacteria. And they have free permeability um, in this inner membrane for smaller solutes like uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. Okay, so now you have these little invaginations here, is that, that's what they're actually called, and these invaginations are going to be um, higher number in the, um, in, in the skeletal muscle, in the heart where you need more energy. Uh, and these are actually called cristae, which translates to crests. And it's this inner membrane that you're going to have these proteins. As I mentioned in the first video, we have the, all the complexes for the electron transport chain. So if there's more invaginations here, then you can have more um, electron transport activity, a, a more electron transport um, cell uh, uh, proteins lined up for, to produce more ATP. So that's why these invaginations are greater where you need more energy so you can perform more respiration at a time. So that's the inner membrane. And we've already covered the outer membrane. So inside the inner membrane here is something called a matrix. And this is in green, this green uh, dashed line here. And that's uh, the inside of this cell, uh, the, the mitochondria. And that is less than 50% water. So it's more of a gel-like fluid. And that's going to house all the enzymes for metabolism, substrates, the nucleotides, which are the monomers for DNA. Uh, as well as the cofactors and coenzymes. And cofactors and coenzymes, once again, are the um, kind of, they go with the enzymes to make the enzymes fold correctly so they can perform their function correctly. So these are critical to allow the enzymes to function right. So these cofactors and coenzymes. And those are like the metals, um, minerals, uh, vitamins. These are all coenzymes and cofactors. And then we just have organic ions, like uh, the hydrogen ions that I mentioned. Well, they're, they're hydrogen ions are not organic, but these small organic ions. And another thing to point out here is that the pH of the matrix is roughly 7.8, which is pretty alkaline. <clears throat> and alkalinity, or pH, is important uh, for, for um, enzymes, because the pH is critical for the enzyme to fold correctly. So if this pH uh, jumps up or jumps down too high or too low, the enzymes and the proteins, they will not be able to fold correctly and they will not be able to function properly. So pH is incredibly important in the body, uh, in cells. So, and then we have the uh, inner membrane. Okay, so the matrix, just to, to, to refer to my first video, that's where the Krebs cycle is. This is where, um, that that Krebs cycle happens is in the matrix and like I mentioned before the inner membrane is where the electron transport chain takes place 
And it's this intermembrane, interbetween the outer and inner membrane, is where all those hydrogens were pushed to create a, a positive gradient to kind of drive ATP synthase into creating more ATP. So that is in this area right here between the two membranes. And the pH here is 7 to 7.4 which I find rather striking because of the fact that it, it does push protons into this space. So <clears throat> it's just important to, to just re recognize that pH is, is critical for functionality of an, you know, for, for the machinery to work correctly. So that's pretty much an overall anatomy. Oh, in coming back to the matrix, um, we uh, the mitochondria being evolved from gram-negative bacteria, they have their own DNA, actually. And it's called mtDNA for mitochondrial DNA. So they have 13 um, genes that code for proteins that are found in the inner membrane in, in complex 1. Which is interesting because complex 1 is just a massive multi-protein complex that has both DNA... Uh, proteins that are made from DNA from the mitochondria and our mammalian uh, eukaryotic cells, so basically our cells, uh, nuclear uh, genes to make up uh, proteins in complex ones. So it's a nice further expression of a symbiotic relationship in that regard. So the, the genes also code for 22 tRNA, and a tRNA is kind of like a hinge uh, reaction uh, molecule between a gene and a protein. So tRNA is transfer RNA and it helps bring the amino acids, which are monomers for protein, uh, together uh, and they read off in, uh, the code that's made from genes to make the protein. So it's involved in making proteins from genes, a uh, simpler way to put it. And it also, the, the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA also codes for two ribosomal RNAs. <clears throat> and they're also involved in um, forming proteins from DNA. And they have also enzymatic properties. So sometimes ribosomes and ribozymes also function as enzymes. So that's found in the matrix of our mitochondria. So in, in preparing for this, I had dis, you know, discovered that these were in, you know, originally gram-negative bacteria. Um, and I started looking into uh, most of the bacterial infections that, that we suffer from. And we have gram-positive cocci, gram-positive uh, bacillus. We have gram-negative cocci and gram-negative bacillus, which this, I'm assuming, is an ancestry of a gram-negative bacillus uh, bacteria. Most, by majority, most of the disease we suffer, diseases we suffer from through bacterial infection are caused by gram-negative bacillus bacteria, such as pertussis. UTIs can be caused by gram-negative bacteria, sepsis, meningitis, legionnaires, typhoid, dysentery, cholera, plague, salmonella. These are all gram-negative rod or bacillus bacteria that cause these diseases. Um, so it's just a good thing to point out. And, and part of the reason that could be is that um, there's such a, there's a conservation in biology where there's a genetic homology. So... Um, Genes can be conserved through a, a large, like throughout nature. And if mitochondria have a lot of similar genes and a similar um, chemistry that, to these um, gram, gram negative bacteria, then it's possible that they're more likely to interfere with the normal functioning of the mitochondria. So it is possible that these bacterial infections uh, interfere with some of the um, functions of our mitochondria. So that's why I brought it up. So I kind of jump forward on that. I kind of want to say that to the end, but I just wanted to re-highlight the inner membrane proteins here, all these complexes. And I just want to re-highlight that uh, complex one takes 12 iron atoms and 12 sulfur atoms. And the sulfur is usually come in the form with cysteine, which is an amino acid. 
And uh, protein is one of the number one sources we get our sulfur. Complex 2, again, has got 9 ions, 10 sulfurs, and a heme group. Now, these heme groups are similar to the heme found in red blood cells that carry oxygen through our body, as well as um, myoglobin, which carries oxygen through our muscles. Complex 3 has got two irons and two sulfurs, and then three heme groups, again, in a cytochrome, which also has um, aspects of uh, hemoglobin as well in that with a porphyrin ring and I believe there's an iron in there as well and then complex four has got the copper and the oxygen and, and, and once again two heme groups and just to kind of bury a dead horse here these are found in the inner membrane which are right in here they're all lined up in these in this membrane here and they are uh, producing ATP uh, at a higher uh, capacity than, than um, uh, glycolysis in the, in the Krebs cycle. So researchers have actually found that there are some poisons uh, and antibiotics that uh, interfere with these complexes. And this is rotenone, and rotenone <clears throat> is used by Amazon tribes, and what they do is they throw this poison into like these small lakes, and it kills all the fish. So they throw the, the rotenone in, into the lake, and in like 30 seconds, I've seen it on like National Geographic, all these fish just, just come to the surface and they just die. So they use this to hunt. And it interferes with one of the complexes here. I'm, I think it might be complex one. So we have rotenone, which is, is a poison. A C, uh, carbon with the triple bound in nitrogen, that's cyanide. And, and carbon monoxide, they also interfere with um, the electron transport chain uh, proteins um, and you know carbon monoxide competes with oxygen for carrying blood when hemoglobin so it's pretty understandable that carbon monoxide is going to interfere with these heme groups here as well Am aminol which is a barbiturate that's going to interfere with these inter intermembrane proteins and these last two are antimycin and oligomycin, and those are two antibiotics, and they're also shown to bind to these complexes and interfere with their chemistry. So, what can we do to improve the value and in, in, in the function of our mitochondria? I would say to provide all the nutrients needed, and like I said in my last video, I started taking um, MSM, and this is Coarse Flakes by Opti MSM, I really like it and I noticed a jump in energy as soon as I started taking it. I'll leave a link below. And it's important to get oxygen to the mitochondria. It is the aerobic part of our bodies, of our cells. So I take uh, Lugol's every once in a while. I just want to make sure I get enough iodine. And um, so that's iodine. And iodine is part of thyroxine and thyroxine is, is a uh, thyroid hormone and that's going to help us bring oxygen into the, uh, into the cells. It's used for oxygen consumption. Uh, excuse me. Um, so I just Lugol's, I, you know, if you're not getting enough iodine, you want to try it, it's, it's very powerful. So I would take actually a drop and put it on your hand and then just rub it in rather than take a drop and then put it in, in water and drink because if you're really deficient it can really uh, cause your, your body to have a strong reaction. Or maybe a drop in, in some water, gargle, and then spit it out and just get iodine very slowly. It can also be transdermal, uh, so just you know, put a drop on your skin and, and over time you'll build up your iodine levels safely. Um, so iodine is very strong. <clears throat> and we also want to make sure we're getting enough iron. Um, and absor absorbing iron, and, and so I, I use sodium ascorbate, and, and I, this is a good brand, I really like it, Susan um, Humphreys, I believe, uh, really educated in, in vitamin C, she recommended, I find it's really good, I'll leave a link below, and what um, vitamin C does is it, it helps us absorb iron, it helps, I believe, change the um, oxidation state of iron so we can absorb it much easier. Um, and then just the, the probi um, probiotics are also going to help because probiotics are going to help 
keep us from getting any other negative or pathogenic or opportunistic bacteria from um, developing colonies in our bodies. Um, so you want to get some probiotics to also help maintain your mitochondrial health. And then just um, one other thing to kind of keep in mind, and I'm going to leave a, um, in, in the um, uh, section below, the, the content section, I'm going to leave a list of all these uh, pathogens, these gram-negative uh, bacteria, and I'm going to leave a list of all the antibiotics that are prescribed for these um, uh, bacteria. So if you do go and you do get sick and you are put on an antibiotic, maybe reference the ones I listed below because they may be more likely to, in to interfere with our mitochondria than other antibiotics since they target what seems to be similar ancestry um, bacteria. And, in, and then as well, if you do get sick and you do take a course of antibiotics or, or not, um, monitor how long it takes you to get your energy levels back up and, and, and monitor your glucose levels because uh, our mitochondria are the driving force for glucose metabolism. So if, if your mitochondria aren't functioning properly, your glucose level levels might may creep up over time. So just kind of uh, be cognizant if you go on an antibiotic program, what the, the effects are like a couple of months out because you, you're going to be sick and, and the recovery time will take a certain amount of time. But, you know, after two or three months, if you're still sluggish, you might want to invest um, some time and energy into um, improving the functionality of your mitochondria because they, they may have uh, suffered fr from the infection as well. Okay, so I think that's pretty much a good overview um, of mitochondria and a course of uh, action there. So anyways, thanks a lot.